You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Taylor Moore on the show with me. Uh, Taylor is is one of those authors uh, that when you read their debut and and Downrange is his debut, and it's a, a the first novel in what I know is going to be a long running series with a fantastic character called Garrett Cole. Downrange is one of those books that you must have. This is that's not even a recommendation. This is a must have if you are a thriller lover. Uh, you just got to get you got to get this book. Uh, we're going to have links to it in the show notes where you can go grab your copy. Taylor, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Well, th- Hank, thanks for having me on the show, and thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, Taylor, we're going to so much that we uh, want to talk about today. But before we get started, we begin each show with the same question. And that question okay. is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm, my parents will tell you that I um, I was kind of a storyteller from the beginning. Um, you know, just as a kid, I loved to you know tell jokes or whatever. And, and I'm not only did I like telling them, I liked living out stories. And, you know, as a, at an early age, um, I, I liked adventures. I liked to get into things myself. And so, um, I, I think I always just sort of had this, you know, passion for adventure and passion for storytelling that sort of culminated in this, uh, you know, idea of, well, why don't I put those t- two passions together? And, um, and so my first book that I wrote was back in the year 2000. And I think I always wanted to write a book. And so I did it. I was working on my you know, dad's cattle ranch at the time. And, uh, and I just got my laptop out and over the course of months started writing. Uh, and it was more one of those just to see, could I do this thing? And so I wrote a young adult novel. And to this day, I don't really even know where it is. I hope it's somewhere, <laughs> but I never did anything <laughs> with it. It was more just like, a, can you do this kind of a thing? And uh, that was 2000. So fast forward, you know, two decades uh, to now, and, and now I'm actually doing it for a living. But but I think it's it's been instilled in me a while. I think it's something I always wanted to do. And I think for a lot of people, it's sort of like that kind of run a marathon kind of a deal. Like, let's just see if I can do this thing. And so I never really thought I would do it for a living, but here I am. Well, and you took the obvious path to becoming a thriller writer that that, you know, all writers should do, and that's to join the CIA. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. That does help. <laughs> what what drew you to uh, to intelligence and, and and going down that path? I'm I, I'm I'm assuming uh, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but like a lot of career paths and a lot of things that we we find ourselves doing, it's uh, it's a circuitous path. That did you was this something that you said I'm going to join the CIA or? Did you wind up there under other circumstances? Yeah, no, you know, it it is a weird thing. And people people can never piece my story together. Uh, (laughs) I I always say I promise it makes sense when I explain it to you because I always said, so you went from working on a cattle ranch and then two years later you're in the CIA. How does this all come together? And uh, it actually fits fits together pretty well, believe it or not. But, yeah, I, you know, I'd always had a passion for um, all things international uh, international cultures, international travel, anything, uh, you know, news, that kind of a thing. Um, I always just loved it. I always kind of jokingly say that my, my favorite subject in school was social studies. Remember social studies? I assume they still have it. I I feel like I never hear anyone talking about it, but, but you know, that, that was, um, that was always, I just love learning about cultures and, you know, what's going on in, in the other parts of the world. So anytime I got a chance to travel, I did it. And so I ended up uh, after college, I, I, I got a job, worked for about a year in, uh, in Austin, then kind of just picked up and left and moved down to Argentina. Uh, I would had a good bit of Spanish. I'd lived down in Mexico during college, and uh, I just wanted to work on my Spanish and have a little bit of adventure. So 
went down there and backpacked uh, through South America um, for about six months and came back. And again, was uh, like I said, my, my family has a farm and ranch, so kind of did that work with my dad and then ended up going on to graduate school and studied economics and international relations at Pepperdine. And so, uh, again, I, I didn't know necessarily that I wanted to be at the CIA, but I wanted to do something like that, you know, whether it was, you know, State Department or, you know, FBI or wh whatever, you know, something to do with uh, and, and sort of in that vein. And um, so lo and behold, you know, um, so people, again, I sort of ask, like, well, how did you go from that to that? So um, two things, you know, my that, that sort of international travel that I'd done, uh, definitely because I'd back, backpacked through Bolivia and Peru and Chile and Argentina and went on a, took a, a Russian icebreaker to Antarctica. And so I had that sort of like uh, spirit that they look for, I guess, at the CIA that you can sort of get out there on your own and handle yourself and make your uh, way from point A to point B with, without getting killed. And uh, but then I had the the, um, the education, which was, you know, that master's at, at um uh, in public policy at, at Pepperdine, which was just this phenomenal program. And so I had the economics and international relations. And when I was there, I did a, uh, an, a, an internship at the U S mission to the U European union in Brussels. And so I went there and did, did kind of a international trade type, um, um, internship. And so I just had that background, that experience, and you've got to be able to put yourself out there, present yourself well, write, speak, do all those things. And so it all sort of, yeah, I guess that early passion sort of culminated in me pursuing things that would get me to that next level, and and it did. Taylor, um, I love to hear um, how a sense of place uh, affects writers, and and how where you're from and where you spent formative years of your life, how that tends to seep into the things that you do. Um, I am from South Mississippi, and you, in Mississippi, we have a very rich literary heritage and uh, Southern fiction in general. Yeah. Um, but you are from Texas, and mm -hmm. Texas is an anomaly. Um, it yeah. is South, and it is also Southwest, uh, and it's also its own thing. It's it's Texas, you know. This, yeah. <laughs> when you try yeah. to regionalize Texas, it's like, well, well no, I'm I'm from Texas, you know. Right. Um, right. How how does being from Texas uh, filter into the stories that you tell? And and I and I know that the new book is 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 set in Texas, uh, so yeah. I mean that's kind of the obvious thing. But yeah. but yeah. what is it about the the spirit of Texas? You know that, that's a great observation that you made. That Texas is kind of multiple multiple regional. I mean, it, you can't really. It's, it's it's its own thing, and then it's several different things from within. So you brought up a good point about where you're from and where I'm from. Is I'm really I would consider being more part of the South. You know, there's that sort of Southern sort of feel uh, that I grew up with, and so even I grew up on a farm and ranch, and and it was a, a completely different experience. Uh, and you know, moving to the Texas High Plains, it's a different feel, it's a different culture. Um, you know, I always say, you know, I used to do this you know, for a living, I could, you know, know how to, you know, raise cattle and do this stuff. I wouldn't know what to do up here. It's that different. Uh, I mean, I could learn it, but, uh, you know, I, I always kind of jokingly tell people uh, where I'm from, you know, we we're, we live in this big high rainfall area. And I said, so you're constantly trying to kill things, you know, there's, there's, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, that's probably like Mississippi. If you let a fence line, you know, if you don't take care of it for two years, it's gone. It's just brushes oh, yeah. taking it over and vines and everything else. That's how it was when I grew up. Here, man, it's kind of the high plains. It's almost a desert in some ways, and uh, you're just constantly trying to get things to grow. And um, and you know, the, my area is more populated here. Uh, it's a little more sparse. And so for me, I mean, it's a great question that you ask because yet yeah, I, I grew up in Texas, and yeah, I grew up with that Texas spirit. But moving out here was a little bit different, and and it was different in a good way because. Um, I think this is more what you consider West Texas, you know, even it's sort of Northwest, but I mean, it, it's the Cowboys are different. The dress is different. Everything's a little bit different and the people are a little, are a little bit different, you know? And, uh, and so I, I grew up with that more sort of Southern hospitality. Um, it's just that Southern feel. And it's not that they're not, that they don't have that hospitality up here, but it's just in a different way. It doesn't have that Southern feel that has more of a Western feel to it. And so I think that was good for the book because that's where I'm writing about this area. And because I'm not exactly from West Texas or the Texas Panhandle, um, it made me take um, – I took more notes on how, what people say, how they say it, how they respond to things. 
And, um, and so that was good. That was good for me as a writer because I was up here, you know, I was working in oil and gas when I got out of intelligence and I was working as a, as a landman. And for people who don't know what that is, that's, you're the guy that goes out and makes the, the oil and gas deals. And you're the ones that deal with the ranchers and the landowners. And you're, you know, you're kind of going through uh, for better or worse, that process of getting oil wells out there and, uh, and, and uh, trying to get the oil. And, and so <laughs> there's a lot of ups and downs that comes from that. So I saw every side of everyone from, people that were just ecstatic that you're coming out there to, you know, potentially do something that would be economically beneficial to get off my land. And if you come on here, uh, you know, I'm going to have my gun waiting on the, waiting at the, uh, you know, at the gate and you're, and you're not getting in. So I had a little bit of both. And, and so I got to see a really broad spectrum of, of how people interact and, and react. And not just that, give, you know, being in the oil and gas business, I, you know, I literally would deal with, um, millionaires, you know, that have a lot of oil and gas. And I, I, I always, I, one of the stories I tell is that there are people I've met with that, you know, in, in Hemphill County, where the, the story is set in Roberts County that said, I literally, you know, they'd say, I don't want any more money. And I always thought, I don't know how much money you have to have where you don't want any more of it, but I'm not at that area. <laughs> you know, I've, I've never been there. And, yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, topped that on that yet. No, we haven't. So, so, you know, sort of, so I went from that spectrum to, you know, at, at times I'm out there building, you know, helping to build roads, you know, figuring out where these things go with guys that are driving a bulldozer or whatever. And these guys just sort of eking by and doing their thing. And uh, so I'd meet people that, you know, from everything that people went to, you know, elite, you know, colleges to people that spent time in federal prison for selling drugs. And, um, and so I, I think all of that just sort of came together in a really neat story. And again, I, I'm just, I, I love people. I love characters. And so when I find someone that was, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of different or, or funny or interesting, I just gravitate toward them and I, I kind of soak them in and just um, want to know everything about them. And so I think that played well for the story. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website your home on the web where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy to use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins? PlotPens is cloud-based and optimized for any device. There's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process. The concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and 3 acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub-beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Write. 
we take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000 word book, it's about two cards per chapter roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com. When I first got downrange, uh, I got a, uh, a pre release ARC uh, advanced reader copy. Uh, maybe a couple months ago um, from your publisher. I, I don't remember exactly when yet, but uh, when I first flipped it open and just, you know, started, you know, seeing what, what the book was about and trying to figure out, you know, what you were about. And um, at page one of Downrange, you name drop Sturgill Simpson and uh, Robert Earl Keane. And, yeah. and my ears immediately uh, perked up. Yeah. Uh, what, what role does music play in your creative process? And this may be kind of an, an, an off the wall question, but um, do you do you listen to music when you write? Uh, do you ever hear music and get an inspiration? And, and maybe the story of the song has nothing to do with uh, the story idea that you come up with or, or whatever you're kind of churning over in your brain. But does music inspire or affect your creative process absolutely it does and in fact i just put out on my social media a playlist a, you know a spotify playlist or whatever whatever you listen to i i, nice. I have it on spotify but uh, but if you go to my social media you'll find uh, a card that that we put together that has all the songs that are either in downrange or um or things that inspire or songs that inspired me or, or or a sound that inspired me and uh so some of these um or like you know, you mentioned Robert O. King, Sturgill Simpson. Uh, there's so many things that so I don't just so people know when I write, I don't have music on because it would it would distract me. I can listen to a lot of sound, or you know, I write a lot at, at a coffee house, and uh, and so there's always music playing, but I don't have earbuds or anything in unless I'm editing, and then I'll put on like classical or something, or you know, movie instrumental type of stuff. But but no, absolutely. And so when I, you know, a lot of times when I go to this coffee house, I'll put on, depending on the scene that I know that I need to write, um, I'll, I'll put on a certain song uh, to get me inspired. And um, and so, yeah, the Robert O'Keens, the Sturgill Simpsons, the Lyle Lovitz, um, these people, I mean, they're not only good artists and, you know, in terms of music and, you know, and great voices and all that, their lyrics mean so much to me. Uh, Ryan Bingham's on there. I mean, a whole bunch of them. I'm gonna, I'm oh, yeah. Forget. Um, but but yeah, sometimes when I'm, when I'm driving there, I, I'll know what scene I want. And so I'll listen to it. And um, and it's meaningful. Um, I think it's feeling good again. It's the Robert O. King song. But when I moved back from Texas, when I got out of the agency and, and was back to Texas, um, I remember listening to that song driving down the road. I think it was between San Antonio and Austin. And that song struck such a chord with me because I felt good again. You know, while I loved working in the agency and I was still doing intel work with the military at the time, I was back in Texas. I was back home and I felt good again. I felt like this is where I was meant to be. And so that, this, that's Garrett's story without giving too much away. He comes back home, you know, and and, and he's been wanting that looking for that and i think anybody who's ever left home and loves their home um i think that will resonate with people when they read the book because we've all or i say we've all a lot of us have been there where you're you've been away for too long and you just want to get back and you want to feel comfortable and you want to get back to where your roots are and and so the, the music plays a big part of that just breathe by willie nelson is on that uh, playlist uh, which he yeah. is a duet that he does with his son lucas and um, yeah. I, I've had that on, on a number of writing playlists. It, it's one of those songs that just seeps in and kind of gets yeah. a hold of you. Uh, but enough geeking out about that, that we could yeah. talk about that all day. Um, yeah. y your, uh, protagonist Garrett Cole mm -hmm. in, in this series, um, am I right that he, um, originally showed up as a secondary character in another story you were writing? That that's the absolute truth, and um and so basically what happened the 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 story the book that I got my in series that I got my agent with um 
is not the story is not the story of the series that you will be reading <laughs> that one again uh, kind of like the first book that I wrote I guess we'll just sit on my laptop and and that's fine you know it took a lot of practice to get to this point but yeah Garrett was a secondary character in a, in a story about a CIA uh, officer and, you know not surprising that given my background that was what I went with and there's and, and the CIA is still a big part of this but it, but obviously Garrett's the uh, DEA and um, so, yeah, he was a secondary character. And, and sort of the funny thing about when I wrote him into that book, I kind of was always waiting for someone to say to say what my agent said. And, and it's that that's your protagonist right there. It, you don't know this when you go into things, but sometimes people just steal the show and and he kind of stole the show a little bit. He was just cool. He was different. Um, and and. I guess he's a little bit more of me. I mean, and I know this sounds really strange. This is one of those kind of, in, in, you know, how do stories come about? How do things happen? Uh, kind of scenarios. But, but um, I was trying to write someone more like myself into the first book as my protagonist, and I don't think I, I, I don't think that was me. I think I was probably more Garrett in a way and um and it sounds strange that if you look at me i'm fairly clean cut i've got a beard but not the i don't look like the narc uh undercover narc that garrett <laughs> does but uh but 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 there's more to to looks right i mean it's it's all about the heart and, and what's within and and so i think garrett i, I kind of joke that um that he's sort of the straight man in the book if you think about it he's dealing with a crazy family you know the cia and he's the guy that's just like trying to get through life without you know <laughs> like everybody's crazy but him and he's just yeah. trying to do the right thing and, and get the job done. And and so I always joke that um, that's me. I always feel like I'm I'm the sane one and everyone else is crazy. And that's probably the definition of being crazy when you think everyone else is but you. But <laughs> right. uh, but and we, we probably all think that. But but so I, I, I think his sort of uh, internal thoughts sort of came out a little bit um, in navigating this crazy world between law enforcement, international relations, uh, the CIA, uh, cartels terrorists, whatever it is, he's just sort of navigating that world and trying to do, to do the right thing. And so, yeah, he sort of broke out of the pack and, and became the lead guy. And, uh, and we never looked back. Um, Garrett is a is an undercover uh, DEA agent, uh, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. And you uh, were in the CIA and, and then uh, had other um, jobs from there. Uh, but it, you you say that Garrett is is so much like you in a lot of ways. What what drove you to to have him as a DEA agent instead of uh, maybe you know a, something you could directly uh, uh, commiserate with, like making him a CIA agent? What what was it that 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 got you to add that that layer of separation between him and you? So I think um, there's two things, and, and one of them was, I mean, one that he just sort of broke out, and that just happened to be his job. But um, but I think one one of the things my agent and I talked about, and I've got a great agent, John Talbot. He's just a phenomenal editor, phenomenal guy, just um, all around great at what he does. And um, and so we discussed a lot of things. And when I was first writing the the CIA stuff, I can't remember how John phrased it. He probably phrased it in a nicer way, but but basically, I think he was he said something like, you know, what I'm writing is a little bit too boring. And uh, but it was he didn't say it like that. But what he <laughs> meant was, uh, or, you know, what what the takeaway was is that I was trying to make things too real, if you know what I mean, because yeah. I had done that CIA work. I was like, well, it wouldn't happen that way. It happened this way. And, and John was nicely saying, well, this is fiction. You know, make it realistic. Don't don't, you know, go, go totally off the rails. But if you make it too realistic, then it's boring. And he's 100 percent right. Um, and so writing Garrett, you know, because I wasn't law enforcement, you know, because I was, had a totally different job, it sort of freed me up to, to get into his world um, and write things a little bit more like I, I, I didn't feel like I had to because I'd done the CIA work. I, I didn't feel like I had to totally stick to exactly how it goes down because, you know, even cops and when you talk to them, they always say like, you know, 99 percent of the job is, you know. You know, whatever. I mean, it's not it's not what you see on TV. You know, there is that one percent where there's the car chase or, or whatever. But um, but it, nobody wants to watch them fill out paperwork all day. And and so so some of it was that. And then some of it was just to bring uh, the idea of doing more of a domestic series. Um, we, we, you know, the CIA is not that there's not a you know, that, that they don't have a domestic arm, you know, 
working with uh, you know the FBI and DEA and all these people. But there, um, but for Garrett to really do what he wanted to do, I think he needed to have a, a you know a domestic, uh, a, more of a domestic job. You know, and, you know DEA or FBI, they can work international or domestic. But I think it just fit what he needed to do to do better, and for me to tell the story that I wanted to tell that takes place here in Texas. I like what you said about um, th- there. There's a problem in being too real. Uh, it, it's like. Um, you know, back in the day, we didn't pick up a Tom Clancy novel because uh, it, even though a lot of his details were just spot on and he could really immerse you um, because there was so much detail, none of us really expected Jack Ryan to be the guy that actually lived next door. You know, he, he was kind of kind of an every guy, but but a bit of a superhero at the same time. Yeah. And you kind of need a little bit of that in fiction. That's why we go to fiction, too escape and see people that are kind of better than ourselves <laughs> right right absolutely so yeah no i mean nobody wants to um yeah i mean you know if you saw the actual day of a of a cia intelligence officer again most of it you know is behind a computer you're doing your research you're doing no matter what job you have you're, there's that sort of boring element to it of of you know and and again there's the the the, the sort of wild things that do happen but that's really what you want to see in fiction and not the guy behind his computer all day long. So, um, so yeah, that's just reality. Downrange has a very, uh, intricate plot that there's a lot going on in the, in the book. Um, yet it kind of unfolds and unwinds in a way that every step is, uh, is, is, is plausible. This is just how the story unfolds and one thing leads to another, uh, a lot like that, uh, the domino, you know, scenario yeah. that that we all know. Um, when you start thinking about a a plot situation and and what you're going to put Garrett in, and what you know, what are the 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 big puzzle pieces that need to be solved in this? How do you start approaching? the do you uh do you lay out kind of these are the big ideas in the novel, and then you know how do I get Garrett from point A to to B to C to eventually Z? Um, or do you start uh, you know, are there things that that are on your mind, you know, that uh, maybe um, world events or whatever? And you say, well, I, I wonder how someone would navigate these waters. Like, how do you start thinking about the plot that you're going to invent? Man, I'll, I'll let you know when I figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. People ask me, like, well, do you go by, you know, like a three act method? You know, do you do do you plot this thing out and or outline? And I go. I'm, I keep, I'm, I mean to do that. I'm going to do that one day, I promise. And, and I don't do it for some reason. So maybe that's just not my method. Um, usually what I think of is sort of the coolness factor of something. I like, I see things or think about things. I think, man, that'd be cool to, to see. Um, so again, you know, not to give anything away about downrange, but I, I, it's kind of a modern Western mixed with the operator style thriller, right? I mean, I just thought I haven't seen anything like that. I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, so I just put those two together and this is what happens, you know, and and so I, I think I start with sort of a premise uh, and book two is like that, too. I thought of something really cool and I won't give that away yet, but I, I thought what would happen if this this group met this group, you know, and uh, how would that play out? And it's kind of like the MMA theory, like let's put these, you know, different mixed martial arts type people together and see what happens, see who comes out on top. And so I think a lot of it just starts with an idea of um, of what. Um, you know, what, what I would like to see play out and the things that I like. And, and, uh, and I start from there, then I put Garrett in that, that situation. And then I think of a problem, like how, what's going to be the problem here. And I just sort of let him get through it. So I don't really a hundred percent outline, you know, like, here's how the story's going to start or here's where it's going to end. I sort of, um, I have a general idea. I'll have like a general, you know, because I, I send, I'll send these to my publisher or my agent and say like, hey, here's what I want. Because I think I've sort of outlined out to like page to, to book six or something at least at this point. Uh, and so I've so far I've, I've pretty, uh, you know, I'm about to start book three. And so I've, I've stuck with that pretty well, although I think I'm going to I think I'm going to switch book three and book four. Um, but I'll, I'll have to talk to with that to my, about that with my editor. But um, but yeah, so um yeah, I think I just start with a premise and I just say, like, let's let's let these guys work th- through these things. And, you know, the thing about Garrett, I, I wanted him to be, you know, you mentioned Jack Ryan. 
Um, and I guess Garrett maybe has more skills because he was a Green Beret and, you know, he did the, the DEA stuff. And, um, you know, in, in terms of like combat or fighting or whatever, he's got a little more skills, but he's still just a normal guy. And, and I, I tell people all the time, I, I, wrote, I didn't want him to be a superhero um, because these guys mostly really aren't superheroes. I mean, I, you know, I'm friends with SEALs and Green Berets and Rangers and all that. And they're, they're just normal guys. I mean, they're not normal in the, in the kind of thing they've done, but, you know, they just grew up um, like, w- like we all did. And they just took this route and, and got there. So I wanted Garrett to still be normal and still be scared and still be anxious or you know what i mean i wanted him to have all those normal emotions that a real person would have without being um you know like like a you know the ultimate superhero that that never loses or never uh is is worried or whatever so um but yeah you know back to your question i just i think i I just try to put good characters in and i try to make it um as you notice in downrange probably in, in book two you'll see this they don't just have you know the i wanted there to be relatable problems in every book and so it's not just a case of you know because most of us can't relate to terrorists wanting to kill us or cartel assassins you know coming after us that's hopefully not relatable not. Uh, yeah hopefully not but it is fun it's fun to read right. about but i wanted everybody everybody's had uh, a sibling you know maybe that they were a strange you know strange with or had an argument with or a parent that they're in a feud with or uh, what is it like to to run into the old high school fl- uh, flame or the old high school uh, crush or you know what I mean? So so those yeah. are the elements I wanted to put in the story, and I kind of know that going in, and and then I just work those in work work those in as I go. Taylor, I've heard Downrange talked about as an action adventure story mm-hmm. and also a suspense thriller. How do you feel about those distinctions? Um. It, it's kind of everything, right? I mean, it really is. Um, I mean, it, 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 there is, there is the, the suspense thriller. It sort of fits those definitions in a way. And then the, the action adventure, there's a lot of action and a lot of adventure. I mean, it kind of, it's kind of a little bit of everything. And um, I, I don't know exactly where it falls. Um, uh, and, and book two is the same way. And, and I kind of always jokingly say, I, I, there was so much, you know, action's hard to write and do it well. And, uh, and not exhaust your reader, but keep it the, enough suspense and intrigue, like what's going to happen that, you know, you got to like take your reader on this like journey that's going to be hard and it's going to be exhausting, but you can't like over exhaust them. You got to give them a little downtime too. Um, and just action is hard to write. And, um, and so I said, man, I'm never going to do that again after downrange and man, damn, if I didn't do that for book two, I kind of, you know, I got into that action adventure, like uh, wild stuff, kind of like in book one. And, and so far it's, it's resonating well with, uh, with the readers or, you know, the, the, the few reader or, or reader, I guess I should say that I've had on it or two, two readers, but um, it's resonating well. So I did it again. I don't know. It just, that's what comes out and, and uh, I don't intend to do that, but that's what, what happens. A little more, uh, or the, over a decade ago, Craig Johnson uh, started the the Longmire mystery series and and planted his flag in um, in in the uh, the American West and has has told so many great stories based there. Then we've got guys like C.J. Box who've come along and are telling other great stories out there. And now we have you with with Garrett Cole you know, firmly planting your flag in the the American Southwest in Texas. Um, what do you think about this uh, renewed interest in in uh, American Western stories? I think it's obviously I think it's really cool. Um, I love it. Uh, uh, Craig Johnson and CJ Box, obviously, you know, two successful series that are fantastic and fun to read. And when I set out to do um, downrange you know on the, on the texas high plains the ano estacado um i wanted to do what 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 johnson and box did uh and i kind of call it world building it, it's and, and i guess it's not really world building because it's a world that does exist but it doesn't exist for a lot of readers just as you know montana or wyoming uh didn't really exist for me because i've never been there obviously i've seen movies or you know whatever but um but like, you know, the world that CJ Box creates, I want to go and be in, be in there, in that world that he's created. I want to see what it's like. And I, I think, you know, both guys do a very good job of creating these sort of compelling side characters 
that you want to meet and you want to be friends with and you want to know. And, uh, and, and so that's what I really strive to do in downrange is sort of create this world where people are like, man, I've never been to the Texas high plains, but I want to go visit it. And, and I, and the funny thing is, you know, the, 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 all the restaurants and everything that's in the book are places you can go and exist. And uh, I'm sure people are, are not going to believe that there's really a stumbling goat saloon, but there is, you know, and you can go have a hamburger and a beer and uh, just like Garrett does or, uh, you know, Cattle Exchange. It's a great restaurant. And uh, I, I think I put a few in there and I do that in book, too. So uh, Canadian Texas is a real place and you can go to you can go in Perryton and Pampa and um all these other places i put in there you can drive around and see them and they're neat and unique and um and, and so i like that i like being able to, to create this sort of world for people that have no idea that it exists but it's a place you can actually go so to me that's a lot of fun well taylor you have uh caused me to start looking for a place to put a new bookshelf that's going to hold all of the garrett cole novels that i know will be coming out um, and just before we started recording, I know that you said that you had recently turned in uh, a first draft of a book two. Um, congratulations on that. It Thank sounds you. like Garrett is uh, is picking up a head of steam and 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 going to be around for a while. Garrett, thank you. And, and, and Garrett is, yeah, Garrett is hopefully here to stay for a while. And I, I've got a lot of uh, books planned for him and a lot of adventures. And um, and again, you know, like I said in, in the book, if I. I try to do my, my, my big deal as I want to make uh, compelling side characters. You know, I, everybody likes the protagonist usually if it's a successful series. But I, I, I strive to make every character in the story as, as equally, you know, as compelling as the protagonist. And so I think people I hope people are going to want to follow their stories as well. And so um, a lot of the stories you, uh, are the characters you'll see in downrange that are that are really side characters, bit characters turn out to be bigger in, in book two and and so i think it makes it fun so it's it's not like you're introducing someone for the sake of doing it and you'll never see them again you're gonna see them again so pay close attention to what they do and say because it, it'll it'll matter in book two and book three and book four and book five taylor have you have have you gotten the opportunity to listen to any of the uh audiobook narration a little bit just I, I did receive the audio gallery a long time ago and i've just been so busy i mean there's you know i'd love to just sit there and listen to it the whole way through but uh between writing a second book and doing all the marketing and publicity and everything that, that comes along with this and just being a full-time you know like husband and dad and everything my, <laughs> my, my plate's pretty full and uh and so i haven't but I've, I've listened to bits and pieces of it and it's really really good so if people in, enjoy the audio uh definitely get that and I, I can't wait to just listen to it through at some point i'm hoping i'll have a little time to, to do that or a road trip or something but no it's fantastic well, when you're hearing this episode uh downrange is available everywhere today uh we're publishing this episode on release day for the book you can go grab it in kindle edition or hardcover we're going to put links to it in the show notes as well as audiobook uh, you can grab it over on audible.com uh, or go visit your local bookstore and and spend your money locally and and let's keep bookstores uh, in business. Uh, Taylor, this has been so much fun chatting. I love the new book. I love Garrett Cole. I I, I think there are amazing things in store, uh, not only for uh, for Garrett but for you as a writer. Um, if you are if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? I'm at rtaylormore.com, uh, and so they can look and find out more about me and more about uh, what Garrett's going to do. And uh, and I'm I'm in the process of building a new website, so so that'll be out soon. And it'll be a more interactive type thing. And um, but it's um, but yeah, so that's where you go. But hey, listen, thanks for having me on. Thank you for the very kind words, and uh, I appreciate that. And yeah, hopefully hopefully more to come with Garrett. Absolutely, we're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of Downrange, available everywhere now. Taylor, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hank, thanks for having me on. Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade, Forgotten Ruin, Book Two, by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole. Narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter One. The army of the dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. 
Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51, a one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nano-plague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. About 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us, Claymore Mines, the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne, had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush, only to get ruined by the daisy-chained Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us, and an early one at that. But there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors carrying spear and shield. Other, darker creatures barely seen. The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still... The brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearms scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching Army of the Dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain we'd kill them there and I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing, whispered Sergeant Kang over the calm as he detonated the mines, and eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the Bronze or Iron Ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales. Green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some. Rotting boots. Helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts. Beads and charms dangling from bone wrists. Enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, draped about the spine where the throat should be. Where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence. Malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. 
Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking a hot cup of coffee would be nice about now, except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.